complicated DMEC is basically my favorite operation. It's the operation we've pretty much dedicated our practice, dedicated my life to. And I want to show you a really interesting, fun case that we did just yesterday on a really special patient. This is a gentleman with congenital aniridia. This is his only eye, and he had all of the problems you get with congenital aniridia. He had corneal opacification. He had limbal stem cell problems. He developed cataracts at an early age. He had zonal problems with the lens. He had glaucoma. And for all of these problems, he had a series of really complex surgeries. He had cataract surgery with a scleral fixated lens. He had a tube shunt placed, and he had a penetrating keratoplasty. And all of those operations were done by really talented surgeons, but he came to see me because his prior PK had failed. He had corneal edema, and now it's time to do something. You could replace the PK with a new PK, but you hate to do that because this is his only good seeing eye, and that has a year-long recovery period, and he's got limbal stem cell problems, so you worry about re-epithelializing the graft. You could put a DSEC on the back of this PK, but you hate to do an operation if there's a better one available. And this video shows how to do a DMEC in an eye like this. Now the patient is under general anesthesia because one of the problems you have in this condition is nystagmus. And I thought, well, if we're gonna do this operation, we need to have the eye as well set up for success as possible. And that means immobile in this young patient comfortable. So we've got the patient asleep on the operating room table. And what we are going to do is to try to strip the back of his existing PK. We're gonna trim the tube shunt that he has, and we're gonna put a DMET graft in the eye. And there are some challenges. One challenge is we're dealing with a hyper deep anterior chamber because there's no iris, because he's been vitrectomized, and his IOL is slightly tilted. And I worry about losing the graft into the back of the eye, especially because we have to use a small graft in this eye. He's got a PK. So our DMAC has to be smaller than the size of his PK. In this instance, we're using a six and a half millimeter DMAC graft. So we'll have a tiny graft spinning around in the depths of the anterior chamber here. And I wanna show how this operation can be done safely and efficiently and predictably. So I'm making a few paracentesis to give myself good access to the eye. This is a 2.4 millimeter keratome used to make a clear corneal incision temporarily. And one thing that we're gonna do, in fact, the way we're gonna start the operation is by trimming the tube shunt. So I've got a large bore anterior chamber maintainer with fluid running into the eye. I'm gonna reach into the eye and I'm gonna grab the tube shunt with coaxial forceps. And these are curved 25 gauge retina scissors and I'll snip the tube shunt and pull out part of that length. And the reason I do that is I don't want this tube interacting with the graft. I don't want anything there that would potentially hamper this somewhat difficult unfolding process that we expect. So now the tube is trimmed and we're gonna strip Decimase membrane under air. The reason I like doing this under air is because your visualization is better. You're more able to see the little remnants left behind. And this is particularly important if you're worrying about attachment. So to get your attachments maximized, you should be stripping under air with an AC maintainer connected to air. And then with these little tattered shred remnants left behind after you strip with the Sinsky, I go back and pick with these same coaxial forceps to tear away any thickened or fibrotic remnants that may be left behind. Now, after that's done, after stripping Decimase membrane is done, we have to do something to provide a hospitable environment for DMET graft unfolding. Because I worry with this hyper deep chamber and with the tilted IOL, I worry about dropping this graft into the back of the eye. So the way that we're gonna prevent that is by using a technique described by this brilliant cornea specialist from the UK, Bruce Allen, and he describing using a proline suture to create a mesh webbing stretched across the anterior chamber that provides a platform for DMAC graft unfolding. So this 
is a straight needle with a 9-0 or 10-0 proline stitch, and you can run it in a continuous crisscross pattern across the anterior chamber. Now, I'm doing this incorrectly, okay? The reason that this, what you're seeing now, is incorrect is because I'm passing this stitch from the inferior globe up to the superior globe. And as I do that, I notice a problem, and that is my exposure is just not good. As I pass that stitch, I'm hitting the lid and my hand is uncomfortable against the patient's brow. And I just feel like it's more difficult than it, it really has to be. And I'm passing this stitch here. Now I've sort of turned it and, and I'm putting it across the eye. And I just notice the trajectory of this needle is down. You know, it's heading down and I feel like I don't have control. And I worry about couching this patient's scleral sutured lens into the back of the eye and then that's really going to be a problem. So I realize, okay, well my vantage point just doesn't set me up for success here. So what I'm going to do is I just pull the stitch out at this point and instead I pass it now temporally to nasally, okay? And that is so much more convenient. It's so much easier to pass it this way where you're not running into the patient's upper lid and brow or anterior chamber maintainer. And the concept is you pass the stitch directly across, then you turn and just pass it back to you. And you can just stretch in this continuous fashion a suture across the anterior chamber. Now, the key concept in doing this is you want the stitch to enter and exit the eye about a millimeter posterior to the corneal limbus. If you have the stitch way down deep in the eye, the chamber is much deeper than it should be, and this suture webbing is much less helpful than it could be. The bigger risk, however, is placing the stitches too high up against the cornea, um, too, too limbal. In that situation, you end up with this very shallow anterior chamber between the suture webbing and the back of the cornea. The graft gets entangled in the suture and it's way more trouble. So you want a happy medium and the suture should enter and exit the eye basically a millimeter from the limbus. So I pass it between three and seven times okay, in one direction, which is to say nasally to temporally or temporally to nasally. And then once you have the suture stretched all in one way, then you turn and you pass the stitch in an opposite way, okay? So now here I'm passing these sutures obliquely to the lie of the original suture webbing, okay? So you just go back and forth in the other direction now. And the end result here is you have this meshwork of suture stretched across the anterior chamber, which provides you with an artificial diaphragm on top of which to unfold the DMAC graft. And once you have placed as many throws as you feel comfortable, then you just trim the edges of the stitch and you tie them together, and that cinches the diaphragm taut. So you don't have some floppy sort of noodle spaghetti of stitches. You have a tight, um, uh, so, sort of network of, of, of suture that is a uh, firm, you know, so it's a good solid basis for support, okay? So that's what I'm doing now, so I'm tying the stitch tight. So that's a taut web to unfold the graft on top of. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove air from the anterior chamber and replace that fill with saline, okay? And you'll still notice there's some bubbles in the eye, but those are deep to the IOL. They're not in the anterior chamber. They're way down deep. So the anterior chamber here is filled with saline. Now it's time to inject the graft, but you'll notice I'm switching here, okay? I'm going to use as my illumination source an LED light pipe, which I think gives me better contrast when I'm unfolding than does the normal operating microscope. So I've got the operating microscope off, I've got the LED light pipe on, and here I'm injecting the graft into the eye. And I'm doing this very carefully with tiny little bursts so I don't shoot the graft into the back of the eye. Now, the first thing to do always is to remove these little air bubbles in the interior chamber, which compete with me for control over the graft. So this is a cannula on saline that I'm going to use to aspirate these bubbles. And it's important to use saline rather than air in the aspirating syringe because if you aspirate air with air, 
then you get foam the next time you go to use that syringe. So you only want to be aspirating from the eye with something with saline on it. So once I've removed as many of these bubbles as I can, it's time to unfold the graft. So I'm going to use the same saline cannula through the main wound. I'm into the lumen of that graft and I'm trying to poke it open from the inside. And not only am I trying to unfold the graft a little bit, I'm trying to determine the orientation. And the way I like to do that is by use of the Motsuro sign, the edge of the cannula, the edge of the graft, if it's right side up, should embrace the cannula. The cannula tip should be blue. And here in this situation, as the graft starts to open up, as I start to poke the edges open with the cannula, you can see quite clearly the cannula turns blue here. So those curls are right side up. We're lucky and the graft was injected properly oriented right side up. And now I'm just going to continue to poke the edges of this graft open. And you'll see that suture webbing, how useful it is at shallowing the anterior chamber. It keeps the graft pinned so it doesn't tend to roll up on itself. That's so nice just to be able to manually unfold the edges of the graft in that fashion. And now the graft is mostly unfolded. There are those two edges on either side, but that's fine. I can get those later. I'm going to lift this graft because this is a winning configuration. So I'm putting air underneath the graft now, and that will elevate the graft to the back surface of the cornea, and then I will just bump those inward folds out. So here comes a bubble, and you want to inject a small bubble into the eye here, but sometimes the air just sort of jumps out and you get a big bubble, which is what happens here. And yet still, there's this inward fold superiorly. So the way to eradicate that is by shrinking the bubble here, and that's what I'm doing. I'm aspirating some of that bubble with saline, and I need to go back and get these other little bubbles as well. So I'm going to aspirate those other little bubbles, and then I'm going to shrink the main bubble further, and then I'm going to apply some bubble bump taps to the surface of the cornea trying to get that edge to come out. And you have to use a small bubble if you want that to work. The big bubble applies too much pressure and you'll never get the edge out. But here, even with a small bubble, that edge is sort of ineradicably folded. It still doesn't want to come out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reach through the main wound up on top of the graft and poke it open with my cannula. So I'm on top of the graft here and I'm just poking it open over over there and the graft doesn't dislocate because it's largely held in place by that bubble. So now the graft is totally unfolded and what remains now is only to expand that air bubble in the anterior chamber. So again, I'll go through the main wound and I'll increase the volume of that bubble. And one of the reasons why I like using the main wound in this case is these eyes, when you're operating on them, often tend to be soft. They're soft eyes and they're semi-collapsed. And it's so difficult to get in and out of the paracentesis if you have a soft eye. And so that's, that's one reason why I never suture the main wound, because you want access to the main wound. You need to use the main wound when you're doing so many of these complicated cases. So now I've got the microscope light back on, and the graft, you can see, it's perfectly circular. It's spread out against the back of the cornea exactly like it should be, and the only thing that remains to be done now is to cut these proline stitches that are running across the anterior chamber. And it's just one knot, but you just go around and cut these little loops that are in the sclera, and once you have them all cut, you can just pull these little tags out, and this is what the eye looks like at the end of the operation. Now, normally, when we do DMAC in a typical eye, we just sit the patient up immediately, and they go home with no supine posturing instructions. In this patient, we left him supine for one hour after this operation, because the second he sits up, all that air is going to go back into the back part of the eye, and he'll lose all of his support. So these unicameral patients, we do keep flat for an hour hour. They are a special case. So this was a very exciting, rewarding, fun case for us to do just yesterday because it is so peculiar. And I, with all of these problems, is so rare, but it's so gratifying to be able to do um, an operation that is so much better than the alternatives. A PK is not in this patient's best interest, and a DSEC is not in their best interest either. They are so much better with the best modern operation that we have to offer. And the graft unfolding, which is the intimidating part of the operation, lasted all of two minutes. 
And the key to doing that part of the operation successfully is to use a small diameter graft so it doesn't overlap the recipient PK interface, to use a light pipe so you can see what you are doing so your contrast is better than it would be just with the overhead operating microscope, and most importantly, to use Bruce Allen's iris or uh, his, his proline suture diaphragm technique for shallowing the anterior chamber and giving yourself a platform to unfold the graft on. Try these strategies for your next complicated case, whether it's a DMEC in an anaerobic patient or a DMEC with some hyper deep chamber. Try some of these little tips and techniques and see if it doesn't make your operation more fun and your results better.